Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 27th LaBelle Lecture in Health Services Research. My name is Sofia Garcia, and I'm a second year uh, PhD student in the Health Policy Program, as well as the student LaBelle representative. Uh, so this afternoon, I'm going to be your MC, and I'll be um, introducing a few people. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Jean Arik, who will share a few uh, words of welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 27 Label Lectureships. Uh, so before we start with the lecture, I would like to say a few words in honor of uh, Roberta Label. So Roberta Label was one of CHEPA founding members. Her death in 1991 was unexpected and occurred when broad recognition for research in health economics was just starting to emerge. In memory of Roberta, CHEPA and the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact collaborated on establishing the annual Label Lectureship Series. So Label Lectureship is awarded annually to a young investigator of promise engaged in multidisciplinary health services research with challenging existing methods or accepted ideas in the field. Past lecturers include the likes of Andrew Jones, Peter Sanger, Colin Flood, Mark Kolfer, Jennifer pratt Rutcher, Steve Morgan, Michael Law, and David Stuckler. I would also like to acknowledge the donations received since the first label lecture from more than 20 donors who have generously provided more than $30,000 to the lectureship. Thank you. So I apologize, but I forgot to tell everyone what uh, jean henri does. So he's the director of CHEPA, so the Center of Health Economics and Policy Analysis, and he's also an associate professor in the Department of Health Research Met Methods, Evidence, and Impact. So now we will have Jerry Hurley um, come introduce our lecturer. Uh, Jerry is a dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and a professor in the Department of Economics. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, so I'm really very, very pleased today to be able to introduce Ruth as the uh, 27th LaBelle Lecture. Um, Ruth is, you can see, currently an assistant professor in health sciences at Simon Fraser. And prior to that, she was a postdoctoral fellow at McGill and completed a PhD at UBC in the School of Population and Public Health in 2015. And as is befitting, of course, of the Bell Lectureship, Ruth is truly a rising star in the Canadian health research scene. Uh, she's exceptionally skilled in the uses of administrative data to examine critical questions regarding the performance of our healthcare systems. She complements these data skills with very strong uh, methodological skills, particularly with observational, quasi-experimental uh, kinds of analyses, of course, which exploit then the administrative data. And she uses these skills that they enable her to really tease out answers uh, to questions related to current policy challenges and gain insight as to the kinds of, uh, of policies we should be considering to create a more effective system. And in addition, she brings a very sound understanding of the policy environment. She's very plugged into what's going on and therefore how do the results uh, link into the policy, how, how can it help her interpret the results in a way that's meaningful for policy. And so she really brings a lot to her analyses and her engagement both with the research community and the policy community in, in her work. And I'd also say um, not trivial to her success and I can attest to this because I have had the pleasure of working with Ruth. Uh, she, essentially, she led effectively a project of which I was a member. Uh, she brings incredible maturity to her work, strong organizational skills, an ability to work with teams and make teams themselves work. Uh, and she knows and she has a sense for how to get things done even when it's not clear what should be getting done. <laughs> and especially leading the team to say maybe this is what we should do. And I think that's uh, a non-trivial part of what's actually made her uh, so effective. And it was really a pleasure to work with her uh, as part of a team uh, on one of her projects. 
Um, as the program uh, indicates, her work is focused primarily on uh, primary care reform in British Columbia, but she's investigated a number of other issues on broader aspects of healthcare system performance, including regional variation in healthcare services use, the impact of broader economic events on the behavior of providers and on the utilization of healthcare services, and on challenges uh, facing rural health systems. She's published widely. She's only three years post PhD, and she already has a long list of publications in some leading journals such as Health Economics, multiple papers in each of Health Policy, CMAJ, uh, Health Care Policy, and other journals. So she's very accomplished uh, at its early stage, which of course is why she's so appropriate as a Lebel lecturer uh, this year. And today she is going to be speaking to us about uh, primary care and the uses of secondary data to support uh, understanding what's happening in the primary care sector and the impact of reforms. And um, I'm really pleased, again, to be able to welcome you. So Ruth, welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It is such a pleasure uh, and such a huge honor. Um, so I'm going to talk about primary care. Uh, that's what I study um, and mostly with secondary data um, and focusing on some of the work that we uh, collaborated on around policy change in British Columbia. A little bit about me. So. Um, I'll provide some background about where I'm coming from and some of my doctoral work that led to where I am now. Um, and then there'll be sort of two pieces to the lecture that work around policy change um, and some lessons learned going forward. Um, and some current work around workforce planning in the area of primary care and some questions that we seek to answer. So that's uh, stuff to come. So I'm at Simon Fraser University. Um, I also do work with the Center for Applied Research in Mental Health and Addiction. Won't talk about that work right now, but if that's of interest, uh, sort of where primary care intersects with service delivery systems for mental health. Um, and much of this work spends, stems from my time um, as a PhD student at the Center uh, for Health Services and Policy Research at UBC and where I have ongoing collaboration. So where I'm coming from quite literally, this is a map of British Columbia, but it's a map of British Columbia from my thesis. Um, you can tell it's a map from my thesis because there's, I'm trying to do all the things on one map. Um, so I was really interested in this question of regional variation. Um, and first I nerded out a little bit trying to figure out if I could identify like service delivery networks within the administrative data, sort of groups around hospitals throughout the province. And then I wanted to identify areas that were similar with respect to patterns of service use, because we know that the system is structured really differently in urban and rural contexts. So I'll put both of those things on one map. Um, and then all of that was sort of towards this goal of looking at um, how do costs vary across the province and what can we learn from that. It was such a sexy and appealing idea at the time that just by targeting high, um, high resource use areas, we, you know, we might be able to save money. Um, really compelling work out of the states that showed there were dramatic differences in spending and those higher spending reason, regions weren't getting any better outcomes. Maybe it was even worse. Um, so in Canada, used the admin data in BC to investigate that and we didn't find much variation. And where we did find variation, uh, it was mostly explained by the characteristics of the people who lived in the different regions with respect to their um, uh, age and socioeconomic status and uh, comorbidities. So I'm at that point in your thesis where you're thinking, like, who thought this was a good idea anyway? Um, which I think means you're almost done. I'm not sure, just my experience. Um, but I was easily distracted. So finished making all my maps. Um, and I kept seeing and these articles were coming out in the newspaper around primary care reform in BC and the lessons like what the rest of Canada can learn from BC, um, how BC doctors improved the system for patients and taxpayers. And this was just so inconsistent with my own experience of primary care in BC. Um, and I was curious sort of what was underpinning um, all of this. Um, so this is a little sidebar. Um, any thoughts on why I have a bunch of front doors on the screen? So this is an image of primary care from Andre Picard that can, or our system needs a front door and ideally that should be primary care. It's where we can go to uh, to get most of our needs met, to be referred elsewhere in the system. Ideally it should be inviting and a door that's open at the times that you would want to open it. Um, 
But I think it's a helpful image, and I don't think it's what we have right now in British Columbia. Um, a little, and a note on words, uh, I recognize the difference between primary care and primary health care. It's sort of a broader context or concept that includes um, population-based management processes and health promotion. We do primary care in BC. It's hard to make the case that anything I'm going to talk about today is primary health care. So that's what I'll be saying going forward. And that's not an argument for primary care, just a description of what's up. So primary care should be the front door of our health system, should offer continuity of care, should offer um, comprehensive services for most of our health needs. Um, and, you know, the we often, I think we all cite the same Barbara Starfield article about the contributions of health, um, primary care to health systems, but I really do feel um, very passionately about primary care and that if we can fix that, we can do a lot of good work within our systems. So primary care generally, primary care in BC. Uh, so I'm afraid all my work is in the British Columbia context, so I should provide a little bit more information about that. Um, top right hand corner is what almost all uh, primary care would look like. So that's a fee for service uh, clinic, no rostering of patients, uh, really very few changes since, well, the mid-60s in terms of the structure of primary care delivery. Um, we do have an awful lot of walk-in clinics, um, so that's very common. So in this picture, you've got your Joe Fresh and you've got the medical clinic upstairs, so that would also be a fee-for-service provider choosing to practice in a walk-in style setting. Of course, that means that for many people, the available front door looks more like an emergency department, um, and lots of primary care services happen there too. We do have some community health centers that have been around for quite some time. Um, their roles have changed. Uh, there's a lot of pressure for them to take on more complex patients who aren't being well served within the fee-for-service system, but that's very much the exception to the rule. So that exists, um, but isn't part of the landscape. So quite different from the Ontario setting. Um, maybe more similar to the Ontario setting a couple decades back. And so this idea around primary care reform in BC, what were they talking about in these news clippings I kept seeing? Um, so the General Practice Services Committee, itself a unique structure. So this was doctors of BC in partnership with the Provincial Ministry of Health making decisions around the agenda for primary care. So the structure that sat between those two organizations with no one else at the table um, in planning reform. So the General Practice Services Committee decided not to force doctors into team models like y'all were doing, um, not really, but, um, or attempt to restructure the primary care system. At the heart was the conviction that the doctor-patient dyad um, is a critical attribute of a successful primary care system. So they're really doubling down on the model of solo practice physicians providing care for patients and supporting them over time and across contexts. Um, and this was described um, as an operational reform rather than a structural reform. So can we support doctors in this model without changing too much um, about how things are set up. In conjunction with these articles in the lay press, there were some articles in the academic literature about what was going on, again, super glowing, and just didn't seem to ring true with my experiences. Claims around um, that, that patients uh, receiving care under the reforms um, we're having lower costs, fewer admissions, readmissions, length of stay, really um, wide sweeping claims, enhanced continuity of care. Um, and we're talking about incentives payments here because that really was the bulk of reform. So this idea of an operational ref reform that they put in place were tweaks this fee-for-service system that were an attempt to compensate for uh, areas where patients weren't getting the care they needed. Uh, so. Uh, there wasn't anything around how teams were structured. There was no involvement of other service providers. It really was just incentive payments tweaking the fee-for-service system. So some glowing claims about the effect that those payments were having. Um, and it was all based on a commission evaluation. All right, so this is not my work. This is the work of the consultants who um, uh, were charged with evaluating it. As you can see, you just compare the patients who got incentives for their care with patients who didn't get incentives, uh, and then multiply the difference by the number uh, paid. So, like, forget about your methods course, guys. Just <laughs> simple arithmetic, and we're done. Look. And I mean, this really isn't huge cost savings, so I don't know why they made this big graphic, but 
So it wasn't very satisfying, and it was this type of cross-sectional comparison that all these claims in the media were based on. So I'm doing my thesis, I'm easily distracted, and I thought that this seemed like a bright, shiny new topic that we might pursue. So we, uh, this actually started as a class assignment where I was writing a proposal for Mike Law's course. Um, and the topic I chose was looking at the impact of these incentive payments to primary care physicians on exactly those outcomes that had been cited in the existing evaluation. So again, it's an oversimplification to say that the only primary care reforms in BC were targeted incentive payments. We had some structural changes through, um, through the General Practice Services Committee to bring physicians together in divisions. There were some practice support programs, but this is where the vast majority of the money was invested. Um, but of course, I'm approaching this a little late in the game. The headlines are all out there. Uh, we have no option but to plan a retrospective study that uses the existing administrative data. Um, and in thinking it through, because incentives were it, that's what they were talking about when they were talking about primary care reform, we wanted to see the province-wide impact on patients who might qualify, not just the impact on, among people who received incentives. Um, and again, setting our ambitions high, we wanted to improve on the cross-sectional comparison that I just showed you. So that's what we were thinking of. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yes, so I'm using that term just because we have family physicians and we have some GPs who uh, trained previously and don't have the family medicine residency, but so any but physician, including nurse, including nurse practitioners, because uh, at this point we had maybe 60 province-wide um, in primary care and mostly in those legacy, legacy models, so not part of the picture. Yeah. Sure will. <laughs> Good question. So, incentive payments, this fit within that broader uh, literature on pay for performance, or at least it seemed, except there was no performance. So payments, this is from the guidelines around billing them, where it went to recognize additional work um, beyond just what would be compensated with a $30 office visit uh, to provide guideline informed care um, and take responsibility for a patient over the course of a year. Um, so. Uh, I have my big green participation ribbon because I think this would be most accurately described as pay for participation, not in fact pay for performance. There was no auditing of those care processes. Um, patients were supposed to have that included in their chart, but there would have been no way for the province or GPSC to audit that retrospectively. Um, and this isn't a comprehensive, so there were a whole range of incentives, there were some around mental health, obstetrics care, but the ones we focused on were around chronic disease, so diabetes, CHF, hypertension, and COPD, and complex care, which was for patients who had a list uh, of two or, or two or more of a list of uh, chronic conditions. And it wasn't huge money, so between 50 bucks for hypertension um, and 300 bucks for complex care per patient per year. Um, but it really did add up across all of the patients physicians were seeing. So any other questions about the program itself? Okay, so we're doing retrospective analysis. We can only work from what's in the admin data. Um, so we're looking at hospital, uh, hospitalizations, physician billings, um, and linking uh, across the population. Um, and we were doing something around interrupted time series. Uh, so we know when the policies came into place, and, but there were a few choices, and I'm gonna go on a little bit, uh, go a little bit into the weeds on the decisions we made on how to uh, structure the analysis. Um, and again, the, the outcomes were coming from those existing claims. Hospitalizations especially, how is a $300 or a $50 patient really gonna impact hospitalizations in any short term period of time? But because claims were made around really substantial differences in hospitalizations, we wanted to add that to the list. So our general approach was to look at these th things over time across the whole population that might have benefited and see if we saw a change. And then I plotted a whole bunch of straight lines. So contact with primary care physicians, people weren't getting in to see their doctor all that much more. Continuity of care, again, you really have to squint to see an inflection point there. Care processes, so we were looking 
at screening, we were looking at um, some prescriptions dispensed because we can look at prescriptions across the whole population. We did see some action here. So we saw some action around spirometry. Um, for diabetes, we saw some action around the oral glucose tests. But that's more around care processes used to identify patients who might qualify for the incentives, not in the ongoing management of them. So very little going on. Um, ACR testing ended up uh, that that effect is significant for both diabetes patients um, and hypertension patients, lipid screening. But one of the things we can't tell here is at the same time as incentives came on board, people had a new uh, flow sheet to order testing that accompanied the incentives. So whether this is the effect of having a new paper in your hand or the payment itself, we couldn't determine. So, and then hospitalizations, just not a lot happening. Um, again, hospitalizations, is that really plausible? Uh, but we wanted to look. Um, spending increased because they were paying more. But again, uh, the, because of how this was rolled out and because of sort of who qualified and when, um, our initial ideas of what seemed like a really simple analysis needed a little bit more thought. So uh, that initial cross-section analysis was definitely probla was problematic because patients at baseline were, were different. For the complex care incentives especially, um, patients had fewer comorbidities, higher SES, who actually got the incentives for their care. Um, their baseline health care use, which were our outcome measures in this case, also looked really different. So they were already having higher continuity and fewer hospitalizations. Again, completely consistent with the cross-sectional results um, reported. And then a little bit weirder here is people who got the incentives were um, often getting their first recorded diagnosis in the admin data at the time of the incentive. So we don't have any objective measure that when you are diabetic, we can only see that a physician recorded that ICD code uh, as at the time that services were delivered. So it was definitely happening that uh, people were picking up new cases after the incentives came on board. Um, and then just be people, by definition, having received an incentive, were in front of a GP at that point in time, so had already accessed the health system in some way. Uh, so that point around, uh, so this is data from the chronic disease surveillance system uh, for BC compared to Canada. So not our analysis of the admin data, but analysis of the same admin data. And you can see when the qualifying incentives came on board that not a lot more uh, people with heart failure or hypertension, but a few more. Um, so that, that meant the people diagnosed before. So one of our initial ideas was to compare new cases before and after impact implementation of the incentives, um, but those populations were different, that there was increased vigilance in identifying cases after introduction. We have these baseline differences, and so that initial plan didn't work out. Um, and then, as is the case with, I'm sure, much of your research, um, the processes that led to people having incentives for their care resulted in some uh, wonky patterns. So it really seems that people, so if we line folks up on at study time, so when incentives were built, um, it seems really common that people were hospitalized, were discharged, saw their GP, and then had the incentive built. Um, and so, and obviously people saw the health system when the incentive was built. So there was sort of a cascade of care that led to people being selected into uh, the intervention. And this also meant that lining up a control group was tricky uh, to find a time zero to anchor them around. So, depending on the choices we made, we could have told pretty different stories, uh, but the punchline is that none of them were more complementary towards the incentives. So again, the cross-sectional analysis wasn't surprising that people who uh, had the incentive already had lower costs, um, already had fewer hospitalizations. If you were to just look at the people with the incentive, independent of the control group, all of a sudden you're driving everyone into hospital after the implementation. And again, we know that's just an artifact of people having been hospitalized and gone on to receive the incentive. So our approach was, and this is advice that Morris Spare always gives, um, is just why don't you do it all the ways and then we'll decide after. Which now that I'm in a role supervising students, I understand is actually great advice to give, but as a student, uh, that's frustrating advice. But we did. Um, so uh, 
we carved out everyone who had an existing diagnosis, so to get rid of that fact that our diagnoses over time um, were changing and looked sort of with a control group, um, we lined people up uh, and sort of excluded uh, and did some propensity matching on those pre-period uh, characteristics um, to, with a control group. And then we also just did single time series analysis among people with incentives, uh, both lined up around the date of the incentive billing um, and across the whole population at date of program implementation. And as you'll see, in none of these analyses does it look like the incentives were doing much. Um, it, this one washes out the period where you have higher spending, so things just sort of drop back to the initial line. This captures the fact that people are getting incentives on an ongoing basis, but the answer is pretty consistent across all of the approaches. So we did it all the ways. There were still frustrating limitations. We couldn't follow people up for very long. In the area of primary care, we might hope that or expect that things could take longer to take effect. We're just looking retrospectively, and we had that flow sheet issue where we could never ultimately make claims about the payment versus that added support for care processes. But um, long story short, we didn't see much with respect to primary care visits or continuity. There were some changes around care processes, testing and prescribing, and really no evidence um, of reduced cost as was reflected in the initial arithmetic. Um, this might not be surprising to most people in the room. Um, probably also, so dug up this paper by Dr. LaBelle. I mean, what I'm describing here is essentially a fee change, right? You were getting a little bit more for your visits for chronic uh, conditions uh, so that we didn't see uh, a strong effect is perhaps not surprising. Um, I promised you some lessons learned. I didn't promise that they would be from BC to Ontario. Obviously, we weren't the only province uh, exploring questions around physician incentives. Um, I've edited this to make it apply better to the BC context, um, <laughs> but those were the only changes necessary. But this piece around identifying other factors that were preventing achievement of system goals, so I guess strengthen primary care more broadly, because we just looked at incentives, there, were, there was no attention to other supports that might have helped physicians deliver the care they wanted. Uh, I, yeah, so looking back on um, the design of incentives didn't happen at any point. They just kept rolling them out, um, and there was really no monitoring and evaluation to speak of um, until well past the point where we could productively make changes. So. I mean, did you know that this was on all of the license plates in BC? <laughs> like the hubris of like, like, have you been to other places on earth? Because there are other good ones. Anyway, so BC, this used to be our motto. I forget what it is now. Um, but in the case of primary care, my vote is for Canada's perfect counterfactual in that, well, all y'all were doing stuff. We really didn't do all that much. Um, so incentives have had little effect and there wasn't much going out on uh, in terms of other policy instruments. Um, and again, that was described as operational rather than structural, uh, but the subtext to that is just incentives. Um, and no constructive uh, evaluation or review. Um, and I mean, th and that meant that this wasn't a very satisfying result to report. This is 10 years after the first incentive was rolled out. So me being like, eh, we spent a lot of money on this, you guys, it was well past the point that anyone could make changes to the program. It does mean that I think in the next round of physicians' negotiations, these are very much on the table. Um, but uh, definitely not the type of result that could have been achieved if we'd been part of the process from the start. And then just reflecting it on this as uh, a researcher involved, I think Morris's advice to do it all the possible ways um, is good. I mean, we were lucky in this case that we saw similar things across all the ways. It would have been tougher if we didn't, and I'm not sure what we would have done. Um, and then ultimately in communicating these results to our um, colleagues at the General Practice Services Committee, in Doctors of BC, and in government, the relative simplicity of the evaluation really was a strength and was important in, in having uh, plausible and uh, results that were sort of acceptable um, in that setting. And so I said I asked that question to myself uh, when I was doing my PhD, like who thought this was a good idea anyway. 
And I will admit I asked that question a whole lot of times in the context of this analysis of the incentive program itself. Like, come on, you guys. Who, like, how is this possibly a good idea? You thought you could just tweak the fee structure and then make enormous claims about the impact of primary care reform in BC. And I don't think I was very charitable um, in sort of answering that question. That in implementing these fee changes, it was important to understand the context of really tense relationships between the province and physicians associations. Again, something you might know a little bit about. Uh, this was a gesture of good faith and has built sort of uh, capacity around the General Practice Services Committee in smoothing con discussion, I guess, between those two groups. Um, and it really was spearheaded by people who were providing great care for their patients, so who had practiced in the fee-for-service system, who saw that as working well for the patients they saw, um, and who saw that the problem really was this operational piece, that they just weren't feeling that they were getting the support they needed. The problem is that the people who were in a position to sh craft these incentives weren't representative of everyone. So again, there, were, there was uncertainty at the time. There was lots of enthusiasm around uh, financial incentives. So I think some of my cynicism in doing the analysis was unfair. Uh, but it was important to think through that question. Um, so this was the team. Um, uh, so again, Jerry participated in lots of rambling uh, conference calls from BC, uh, funding from CAHR and data through Population Data BC. Um, and I'm required to put this here. Uh, and in this case, yeah, the opinions may not represent the uh, opinions of the data stewards. So I'm gonna pause briefly, because there's the next chapter where this goes into workforce planning, um, and I'll explain how that works, but are there questions about the incentives? Yeah? So, how did you end up identifying your total population and the non-incentivized, and why, how did you explain that the baseline characteristics were different? So, um, people who would have qualified for the incentives having the same um, constellation of diagnosis codes, right. we looked at whether they were in contact with primary care to some degree. Um, how did we confirm that the... How did you explain that their baseline characteristics yep. were different? Were they incentivized patients just linked to different service providers? Was it more... So people who were doing better already had a good relationship with a primary care physician. They probably already had a good relationship with a good primary care physician. Um, that if you were being actively managed by a specialist, for example, if you were undergoing cancer treatment, you might be less in contact with your primary care physician um, and they wouldn't see you sort of as candidate for the program. Uh, we have, again, so many walk-in clinics that many people may be getting all of their care in that setting, and those physicians might be unwilling to uh, assume the responsibility implied by billing the incentives. Kim is just finishing up some analysis about the difference between physicians who billed the incentives and didn't, and it really is sort of this walk-in clinic um, sort of traditional uh, practice distinction uh, that, that explains it, um, but then there's that sort of piece around what patients are being served by full service family practice uh, versus walk-in clinics that I think shapes the baseline, um, baseline differences. Yeah? Yeah, um, I think I have, a, I'm not going to click through all the slides, but I think it's at the end. Uh, if incomes jumped uh, pretty substantially in 20, uh, 2007. To be charitable, I mean, if you sort of fit the longer line, it meant they kept pace with inflation. So it was a sort of one-time boost, uh, but looking over the longer term, um, it, it, you, you sort of can't account for that. Um, and that, and in terms of they, and so incomes jumped and it really was a fee increase and in that we saw no change in service volume, if anything, some plateauing in service volume, uh, which I think at least is plausible. So, so yeah, it, it was a correction for, um, I think many people would see this as a correction for underpayment within primary care. Um, and the story was around primary care reform, but the motivation was more around fair payment. And so another way to interpret the results is that we gave a pay raise to physicians who were already doing pretty good care and providing uh, services for patients who needed it. Um, and if that had been the claim in the newspaper articles, 
I probably wouldn't have gotten as grumpy, uh, <laughs> but the case was made that this was supposed to affix primary care and that everyone else should learn from it. Yeah. So did you see there's any variation in the uptake of this uh, incentive package? Yeah. Within and across different primary care providers? Um, so we saw some regional differences. So Yeah, so one of the things we observed and puzzled over a little bit is that um, we saw primary care providers who billed it for some of their patients, but also saw patients who appeared eligible but didn't bill it for them. It wasn't super common, but I think we, that sort of speaks to the fact that there are a lot of providers who do walk-in clinic practice a couple days a week and then might have a panel of physicians that they see as their own. Um, so, so that, again, could even operate at the level of individual physician. For the earlier incentives, there was sort of a longer leg where we saw some regional differences in, uh, in uptake over time. For the more expensive in incentives that came in later, they, they came in pretty quick. Everyone knew, um, were familiar with the incentive programs and uh, knew what was coming. Uh, and so uptake was quicker for the complex care incentives. Okay, happy to return to questions on this later, but I do want to rant a little bit about health workforce planning. So I've just finished this analysis. The paper is in CMAJ. And again, this speaks to my enormous privilege that this was one of the most like terrifying moments of my life. Um, but it was. There was a letter in CMAJ about the paper. And I'm worried that people will ask these questions about how did you construct the control group? What went into the propensity matching? All of that. And I read the paper. And it's not about that at all. I mean, they were worried that hospitalizations weren't all that good an outcome, and I agreed with that. But this, uh, so this is from Shelley Ross, who was president of Doctors of BC at the time, um, and pointed to this idea that the support for incentives um, correlates with increases in the number of medical students choosing family medicine as a residency. Um, and so it might have a, not a, have affected patient care, but it might affect workforce planning which is not where I thought they were going to go with this, but this started a bit of a process where we sort of looked for the data that we might have to inform this new hypothesis. Because um, again, this seemed so at odds with what people were reporting in BC. Like, just as they've said, actually it's fixed uh, supply problems. This was all over the news, our uh, physician shortage that, well, I mean, you started, but that we've been dealing with ever since. Uh, well, with Morris's help, of course. <laughs> Kidding, that a good, okay. Um, so yeah, headlines around a physician shortage at the time of, so this is uh, BC Liberals leaving power. Um, and in fact, we do have more family physicians per capita than ever before. BC always has. Um, we see a little bit of a leveling um, of the trend of declining among early career primary care physicians. So that's true, but it's true across Canada. So this argument that BC was uniquely successful in attracting and retaining primary care physicians just didn't make sense because it wasn't any different from Canada-wide. Um, BC is different. So this is a, I'm sorry, a really ugly, uh, ignore this access. So they changed the question wording on the CCHS about having a regular provider. Um, so I put that in to flag that. But compared to the rest of Canada, BC is not looking all that great with respect to having a regular source of care. And again, it might speak to the, how omnipresent walk-in clinics are within the system. So this does seem consistent with that narrative of physician shortage, even um, in the context of higher per capita supply, um, but is inconsistent with the incentives having done a whole lot. This is also very much top of mind for patients in BC. So this is I would love to talk about this in more detail. I won't go into it. Um, I work with the BC uh, Primary Healthcare Research Network, um, and we put together a patient advisory to inform some of our research, and they led a priority setting process around topics for uh, primary care research in BC. They set the questions, the language is all theirs, and top of mind um, in a survey of both patients and primary care providers is inability to find a GP or a primary care provider. Um, in the BC setting. So this is just from this fall. So very much top of mind uh, in British Columbia. So more doctors than ever before, 
less primary care if we look at Commonwealth surveys and if we look at the CCHS question and we have ongoing physician shortage headlines. So this is a long-standing story within health services research, but there's a bit of a twist in how it's being discussed now. Um, so talk about sort of work-life balance, uh, talk about choosing walk-in clinics um, to support like better lifestyle, um, and very much a comparison between younger physicians entering practice now and the older physicians who are well-established. So in talking about physician retirement, and it's often that people don't want to step in to replace them. They're making different choices. And when I presented the results around the incentives, this was exactly the story I got that, well, the incentives worked. They supported, um, they supported people in practice. The problem is that younger doctors aren't just not coming in to do the services that people need. Um, article in Healthy Debate, again, what's up with millennial doctors? What are the choices that they're making? Um, and very much consistent with how millennials are discussed. So you know that this is a real <laughs> search that I did because of the tabs open at the top, like very much early career researcher. Uh, but yeah, your Google autocomplete for millennials. So a, a narrative that's consistent with what we're talking about millennials and a new spin on the story around physician shortages. So again, we, uh, we're just trying to respond to the letter to the editor and sort of think through what we have. Um, at, but there would be a few things going into this. There's that idea that people are making different choices around work-life balance um, and delivering fewer services per physician. Um, and then again, really commonly, there's this idea around walk-in clinic practices, so that people might be delivering lots of services, but not to an attached population of patients, so uh, not in a way that lets people find a family doctor as would be described in the CCHS survey. And then a, a really sort of common part of discussion was the choice of focus practice within primary care. So people completing a family medicine residency um, and looking towards uh, hospital services, um, emergency practice, sports med, um, obstetrics, that sort of thing, which would mean that there are, again, fewer physicians taking on patients um, to deliver primary care. Um, so I'm going to talk about the data that we sort of had to give us some initial ideas and then the planned work that we have to answer these questions a little bit better, and then I will be done. So this is the, the figure, this is when incentives came online. We do see a jump. Um, this is just nominal payments. Uh, the big chronic disease incentive was 2007-8. Um, so more payments over time, uh, like a jump in payments in BC. Um, and the decline in services per physician. Um, but this is consistent between younger physicians and older physicians. Uh, this is just in BC um, and ends in 2013. So we know that people have always practiced differently at the start of the career, but we're not seeing these lines diverge. But again, this is just sort of a squint at some uh, NPD data. We wanted to dig into this a little bit more. We had some information on this idea of walk-in style practice. So we did some work within the admin data to try to identified processes of care that indicated that you uh, accept or accepting responsibility for longitudinal uh, service delivery so that you're starting people on first time uh, prescriptions, you're doing referrals, that sort of thing. Um, and when we cram all that together in a cluster analysis, we have sort of about, about a third of BC physicians who are doing high responsibility of care, a third who are doing some mix, and a third who look primarily like lower responsibility uh, or sort of walk-in style practice. And there obviously is a pattern um, by age in that physicians just starting out were less likely to be in the high responsibility group, but this is just a snapshot at one point in time. We don't know if that's changing. Um, we do have some indication from surveys that uh, family medicine residents fully a third anticipate focused practice uh, and two thirds uh, uh, expect to include a special interest within a more comprehensive practice. And we had some information where we tried to measure comprehensive care within the admin data. So this is less the idea of longitudinal responsibility um, and more just a long list of services, which within the basket are you doing? Um, and we see a decline in comprehensiveness over, uh, over these time periods, but it's across all physician age groups, not just the younger docs. So we wanted to dig into this a little bit more because um, the work-life balance piece is part of it, but it's not the whole story. Um, and that this idea of the types of services people are delivering within primary care has got to be really important to workforce planning. 
um, and it's important to pick apart whether this really is unique to millennial physicians or these are shifts across the whole primary care physician workforce. So we uh, got cash to do this, yay, and we got cash to do this across three provinces. So we'll do that where we're um, working in British Columbia, Ontario, and Nova Scotia um, with a great big team of people who think it's a good idea. Uh, so this includes uh, clinicians in all the provinces, early career uh, clinicians as well as established family physicians, um, strong partnerships from especially the uh, Ministry of Health, Nova Scotia Health Authority, um, because this is a question that everyone can get around. I think everyone might expect that we get slightly different results um, and has sort of different ideas about where this might go, but a topic of interest um, across quite a number of groups. So this is what I'm working on right now. Um, there's a big qualitative component, so in each province we'll interview both early career um, and uh, family medicine residents to understand their decision making and some of the choices uh, that are factors that might be shaping their choices. And then there's a quantitative piece to uh, uh, actually delve into the admin data, define some of these practice patterns. And this is a really fun piece for me where I get to see what works across provinces and then look at some of these changes over a 20 year period. Um, so that's what I'm up to these days. If you have any questions, I would love to talk more about that. Um, so to try to come up with some concluding thoughts, I think what unites uh, these three pieces of work around unwarranted variation, incentive payments, and physician shortages is related to Bob Evans' idea of sort of that for each policy problem there is a solution that is neat, plausible, and wrong, and that like unwarranted variation is just such a plausible and tidy uh, idea. It's like just pay what you want and that or pay pay for what you want and you'll get it within incentive payments does seem awfully plausible. And again, this perennial idea that we have a physician shortage, it's what it feels like um, from a patient perspective, is perfectly plausible. Um, I'm not sure that these are even necessarily policy zombies that keep coming back. Some of them haven't gone away. And again, in the case of incentive payments, the jury very much was out at the time that the policies were put in place. Um, but that in approaching them, and I'm not sure if this is right, but one of the, the things I'm trying to do is make sure that we're able to communicate the evidence from our research in a way that is also neat and plausible to the audiences who really need to know. And part of that is bringing them along for the process. And just in my own research, I'm trying to do a better job of really thinking through who thought this was a good idea, um, letting the perspectives of patients, of clinician partners, uh, inform the agenda to a much greater extent. Um, and where people don't think it's a good idea, learning from that as well. What perspectives are they representing? Um, and again, um, this I think, I hope might be consistent. I really enjoyed reading up on Dr. LaBelle's work. Um, the, this paper on tobacco taxes uh, would definitely fit that idea of policy zombie. Um, so it was such an honor to, uh, to, to get to sort of review some of our work and try to think through um, possible connections. So. That's all from me. I think, do I uh, pause for more questions now? Yeah? Okay. More questions or Aaron? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So we will be able to look at, to, um, we won't have documentation of the specific certificates people have pursued within the college data. So in the quantitative side, we won't be able to pinpoint those individuals, but we'll be able to determine the degree to which we're seeing uptake of focused practice. One of the things I'm really interested in in the cross-provincial piece is that what that means depends a whole lot on how primary care is arranged. So if you're working in a big team um, and you're supported to do some focused practice um, in a setting where other people can provide coverage for patients, so you're sort of blending that. That's a really different thing uh, from a model where physicians are much more independent um, and focused practice really uh, it not connected to uh, 
a place of full service care for patients. So uh, what, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at closely across the settings in the, in the project. And then hopefully on the qualitative side of things, those uh, policy changes around training um, and credentialing uh, will sort of come up and we can explore how those have shaped people's decision makings relative to other sort of personal, personal factors as well. Uh, so very much, so great question. Yeah, very much on the agenda. No, and so they've been, they're partners on the project in that they do a survey um, of residents as they uh, enter and exit their programs, and then uh, the plan is to follow up five years in practice, and they've given us access to all of those survey data. So we've done, so we've got papers just almost coming out, um, actually drawing on Dr. Sweetman's work around uh, uh, like gender and parenthood and practice intentions, um, some work around regional differences in intentions. So they have this survey data um, that hopefully, like we won't link directly, but we'll complement some of the admin data work and the, uh, the qualitative work. Yeah. We'll have more time for questions um, afterwards, so okay. if you have any questions then. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, Michelle Grignon, who will be introducing our discussion today. Michelle Grignon is a professor in the Department of Economics and the Department of Health, Aging, and Society. He is also a CHEPA member. So first of all, I apologize. Nobody told me about the dress code for connections. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the closest I can find. Um, so it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Erin Strumpf to uh, this uh, le lecture. So uh, Erin is an associate professor in two departments, the Department of Economics and the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Occupational Health at McGill University. Uh, she's a William Dawson Scholar and she holds a Chercheur Boursier Award from the Fonds de Recherche du Québec Santé. She received her PhD in, uh, at, uh, from Harvard University. Um, on her website, you can find that she, um, she, well, she's a health economist and that her, her health economics research focuses on measuring the impacts of policies designed to improve the delivery of healthcare services and improve health outcomes, which I find doesn't really do justice to what she actually does. So Erin is, uh, is uh, uh, well, a very, an incredibly skillful um, uh, economist when it comes to evaluating um, policies and policy changes and the impact of policy changes, which means that she, uh, she's one of those magicians who find the right uh, tools from a mesolithic perspective to address really complex uh, and daunting issues. But it's, uh, well, it's not only that, she also applies those, she applies her magic to uh, good questions, which is not that common, and she applies that to questions that are policy relevant, and also she does something that I really uh, very much appreciate. It's not only about efficiency, but also about equity and the uh, quality of outcomes and what, he, what is the impact on uh, various populations. Um, so, uh, well, it's, I always learn a lot from uh, listening to Erin or uh, reading what she writes, so I very much look forward to her discussion. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Erin. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me, uh, and thank you to Ruth for uh, an ex interesting, exciting, uh, inspiring talk, as always. Um, so I was thinking last night, we were having dinner with some of the, the students here in the various programs, and it, I was sort of reminded of a comment that uh, Sherry Gleed made. Um, and so this was after her experience working in Washington to help design and implement Obamacare. And I think she was talking to the ASH, you know, uh, Association of American Health Economics Association, a big conference of health economists, and she was sort of, sort, sort of trying to get at how our research informs these big policy changes. Um, and I think so many of us, especially in the early phase of our career, although some of us hold out hope longer, that we're going to publish that one paper that's going to fix it and that's going to make a really big change. And Sherry's point was that there was at least four decades of research in health economics and health services and policy that went into designing and um, implementing Obamacare, right? It was not one paper, it was not one person, and it was not the work that had been done in the last four or five years. It was decades and decades, and I could look back to my first mentor and her first mentor and, you know, trace all, all that work. Um, so 
those of us now who are, you know, carrying those, those um, issues and, and research forward, I think uh, Sherry's point was that, you know, we're all putting a stone in the foundation of uh, a policy, health policy um, changes. Um, sometimes that's through a paper, sometimes you have one undergraduate student in a class that you teach that's really excited and they don't do a master's in health economics and they don't do a PhD, but maybe they go and they work in government and they actually understand a little bit more about the healthcare system than they would have if they hadn't taken your class and that's actually a, a big um, benefit. So I'm going to focus today a little bit on the, the research side of how we contribute, how we put those stones in the foundation of better uh, health policy, and, and in particular how the things that Ruth talked about sort of caused me to, to reflect um, on that question of how we do what we do. Um, so I think some of the preliminary work that Ruth presented on the health healthcare workforce planning, what struck me about it when I looked at the draft of the slides was that it was just this really simple, descriptive analysis. There weren't fancy regression models. It wasn't quasi-experimental. It was just taking the conventional wisdom or taking claims that are being made and making headlines in the newspapers and saying, does that square with what we see in the basic descriptive statistics, right? And that can be so important in identifying problem areas, um, sort of challenging the conventional wisdom. And to Ruth's point about communicating, those things are really easily understandable by the media, if they want to understand what you're saying, by policymakers, by the public, right? So I think um, as someone who, you know, went through graduate training and came out all teched up to like do these fancy complicated analyses, I am appreciating more and more the power of the, of the simple descriptives, um, both in uh, informing where we go with the research, but just in, in challenging uh, the claims that are, that are put forward um, by various, various groups. Um, the second thing is, is the more complex, sophisticated work that Ruth has done, so particularly the analyses on the incentive payments in BC in primary care. Um, I think it's a really nice example of where, uh, you know, beyond the simple descriptives, where a more uh, sophisticated and careful causal analysis um, can answer important questions. And the first question is, you know, looking at those uh, newspaper headlines and sort of asking the question, did the policy really live up to the hype? Did it work? And does it work? Work can mean all sorts of different things. Let's start at least with the claims that are being made or the claims that were made when, when policymakers put those, those um, interventions in place. And of course it's important to understand sort of as the public to hold our government accountable to, you know, are they, the things they say they're doing, are those things really happening? It's also important to, to crafting future policies or similar policies in other jurisdictions to really understand, um, I'm going to nerd out for a second here, you know, the, is the causal mechanism really operating and is the effect that you see really a causal one and not just, not just correlations. And I also think, um, again, from a research perspective, the, the quasi-experimental uh, designs and estimating those causal relationships, sometimes they help us get at those deeper questions. So not just was this policy effective and did it achieve the claims that are laid out, but, you know, some of us were interested in these very deep relationships between, for example, income and health. And does income, Im more income improve health? Does health improve income? What are those relationships? And so doing something like evaluating a guaranteed income support program or something like that can help you understand those, those more fundamental um, relationships. So these, um, you know, more sophisticated causal analyses, I think, help us both understand the impacts of the policies and potentially um, the deeper relationships we might be interested in as social scientists. Um, one, uh, my third point, Ruth and I had some conversations about sort of how much we think as researchers we want to be responsive to the current policy environment and how much maybe we want to do something else. And in my mind there was sort of this dichotomy about how much we want to follow and how much we want to lead. And I say it's a dichotomy. In practice, we probably do some of both, and that's, that's probably um, the wise choice, a d diversified portfolio. Um, but I think on one side, you know, we can talk about 
you know, and Ruth was sort of framing her research agenda as saying, I'm trying to be responsive to pol current policy changes and the interests of policymakers. Um, and we do that a lot when we exploit these natural experiments. Um, but I think we also run the risk as a research community of kind of analyzing the same policy zombies over and over again because we're only able to evaluate the things that people actually implement. And if the policymakers are kind of following their tail and going in circles, then we're just following them going in circles, right? So I think I was sort of contemplating the extent to which, as researchers, there's a role for our leadership as well, not just following and evaluating what the, what the policymakers implement, but thinking about collectively bringing our knowledge, what we know from all the stones that have been put in the, that foundation um, to help collectively create better designed policies and maybe even more crucially to incorporate evaluation um, into the policy rollout. And what that means is doing evaluation more in real time um, with potentially better data that you may collect in real time, right? So what I do a lot of right now is after the fact, I go back and use administrative databases and I evaluate the impact of a policy and I'm super pleased with myself because I think I've estimated a causal effect. And as Ruth said, it's 10 years after the fact. The policy has long since lived and died. Nobody really cares that much, right? So I think we can do better by exerting, you know, try, <laughs> how we do this is maybe a different lecture, but, you know, trying to think more about in bringing our collective knowledge into the policy design and building the evaluation into that um, in a, in a real-time useful way. And I also think we have something to bring to the table in helping to identify what the important questions are, right? We're being encouraged by our funders to listen to the questions being posed by decision makers. Um, but just, you know, as one example, we have an incredibly rich literature. Probably I couldn't read the whole literature in my, my lifetime at this point on provider payment, pay for performance. We've written so many papers on this. And so what's really the value added of another evaluation, even though it may be in a very spe specific context, time and place specific policy, but maybe there's a, you know, a different sort of marginal return to synthesizing what we already know from this huge number of studies and why things seem to work in some contexts and, and not in others. So um, I think something we can, we can do in that sense. It can be useful to follow, but there's also room, I think, for some, some leadership on our part. Um, my fourth, the fourth thing that sort of came up in, um, in looking at Ruth's presentation is thinking about the sort of balance um, in how much health services and policy research is a science and how much it's advocacy. Um, when I discovered the field of health services and policy research, I was amazed and I thought, wow, I can be involved in healthcare policy, but I can, don't have to dirty my hands with the politics. This is amazing. I found my place. Um, and of course, we can't get away from politics uh, when we work in this field. And, and, you know, even just looking at Ruth's slides, you know, the, the claims in the, the newspapers get me, you know, me also kind of hot under the collar and, and, you know, aggravated because there is, there's so much sort of politics going on in the background. Um, we have lots of claims being made by and, and agendas being dominated by uh, what might, one might call self-interested actors in, in the system that can really dominate the de public debate and the policy environment. Um, and again, this is an area where I struggle, I go back and forth. I think there is a place for agnostic scientific inquiry and there is a place for advocacy. And you can, I, you know, sometimes think about as, you know, different people have different strengths and want to engage on different levels, but there's often a single person who sometimes is doing scientific inquiry and at other times is, is really engaged in advocacy. And so there's also no line between them. It's a big, messy, gray area. But I think there is, it's worth being careful and being thoughtful about when we're doing one and when we're doing another. Um, this comes up a lot in impact evaluation. I'll often have students come into my office, and I should say not just students, colleagues as well, who say, I, I want to do a project, I want to show that this, pro this program works. 
and I scratch my head and I say, is there a question? Is there a research question <laughs> or any kind of question there, right? Um, are, we try are we asking a question about whether something worked or not and trying to kind of st take a step back, um, not be vested in, in the outcome and, and do a, an experiment as scientists? Um, or are we trying to show that something worked, right? And so Ruth gave the example of, of Morris Bear suggesting to do the analysis all the ways. We also have to report the results of the analysis all the ways, right? We can't pick and choose. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great intellectual exercise to say, are the results sensitive to how I chose to define my variables or my control group? But we have to be transparent about that. Um, leveraging our position as experts. So I have a, a former colleague at McGill, Abby Lippman, who was very, very passionate as an advocate and a very um, dedicated researcher. And she was, you know, very clear to separate when she was weighing in on a debate as a scientific expert and when she was weighing in on a debate as a, herself a citizen in sort of an advocacy role, right? And the line can get blurred oftentimes um, in bringing our scientific expertise to advocacy. And I, I think, you know, we want to be uh, careful about that. Um, and just like our physician colleagues declare their conflicts of interest at the beginning of a talk, I think sometimes we have our, as you know, individual citizens, we have our own political leanings, we have our own biases. Um, and so just again, an awareness that, that those exist and, and to be careful and the questions that we ask and how we go about our analyses, um, just keeping track of where we are in that gray area between um, science and, and advocacy. Um, and then the last point I wanted um, to, to make was the question that kept coming up for me in, in, in thinking about the projects that Ruth has laid out and the exercise that I'm also involved in, in in asking, did this policy work? Did this intervention work? And I'm more and more asking, did it work for whom? Um, I think for a long, long time, our healthcare system has been working for payers or working for providers. Um, and you can see that in the research literature because we focus on outcomes that matter and that are priorities for the payers and the providers. We, add, we look at volume, we look at costs, we look at physician income, we look at the number of uh, medical school students choosing primary care as a specialty. Um, and I think I guess I, I hope that we can use the energy that we now have in Canada around patient-oriented research and leverage that to think about a patient-oriented healthcare system. Because the healthcare system, in my opinion, is not there to serve the interests of the health ministry or the providers, but the healthcare system is supposed to be there to, to serve patients. Um, and so when we're asking, did this reform work? Did this intervention work? Are there ways in which we can look at outcomes that are priorities for patients to complement that set, that understanding of whether it worked or not? Um, so just two quick examples. So, you know, we talk about sort of the number of physicians per capita, and we talk about this physician shortage. And I was just starting to think about, you know, why do we, and we care about the number of physicians per capita because we can compare it across provinces and across countries over time. Um, but it, I don't know that it's that useful a measure, right? We already have a pretty clear understanding that doctors are not all the same. We, we have evidence at least that, you know, things like age and gender shape um, people's number of work hours, their, their preferred schedule, their practice uh, patterns. And all, the, all that the number of physicians per population tells us is whether there's a warm body there to see a patient. Um, it doesn't tell us much about the variation across providers, either in terms of their clinical quality, their interpersonal quality, the ways that they engage in patient care in ways that patients want. Um, and it also, you know, the economists in the room, we, <laughs> there are many different ways to achieve a certain outcome, right? There's lots of different potential substitution across providers. That's also kind of not in the discussion when we're just talking about, I mean, I know it is in the discussion, but when we're focused on that, that measure of, of number of physicians per population, it abstracts from that a little bit. So um, in work that I'm working on uh, with Ruth and, and Laurie Goldsmith and some other colleagues, we're, we're looking at um, patient enrollment policies in Quebec and BC, and our patient partners on that project are really bringing to the fore the priorities that they have in terms of 
uh, you know, access to care in a timely way when they need it, um, coordinating the information that they need or that they get in different care settings, um, and even proactive con contact and information sharing. So it doesn't always have to be the patient coming and asking from the physician, but when you know, providers are more proactive in that sense. Um, and we don't think about those things when we think about the number of, of GPs or physicians uh, per population. So I think um, paying attention to the outcomes that patients are prioritizing in addition to the, the pro outcomes that the ministry or the provider groups are prioritizing is really important. And then thinking more creatively about what inputs are needed to achieve of those, the, those outcomes, not just a particular ratio of, of physicians to, to patients. Um, and then the equity piece as well, um, we talk about, so the, the, in this project where we're looking at uh, policies to enroll uh, patients with physicians, again, the ministry cares a lot about whether the number of patients who say they have a primary care physician is going up. The physician organizations are very concerned about what this is going to mean for the workload of GPs and burnout rates, et cetera. Um, the patients have brought up this concern that certain patients, the ones who are more complex, who are vulnerable for socioeconomic reasons, are the, are, the concern is that they're systematically less likely to get enrolled with a physician, right? So we have yet another example of a policy that is kind of a population level policy. It's not targeting any particular group. The question is, are certain patient groups benefiting or not benefiting disproportionately from this general policy? Um, and is that in fact maybe worsening the, the gaps in outcomes and, and care processes that we, that we see? So that's something that we're working on uh, looking at going forward. Um, but I think it highlights again that important question, not just asking if the policy works, but asking those distributional questions about for whom and, and, and why. Um, so those were sort of just some points that came up um, in, in talking with Ruth about her presentation and her work. Um, so I think, I guess I would say, you know, in thinking about how we move forward as a research community and in, in adding those stones to the foundation for better uh, policy going forward, you know, using those descriptive data to carefully but simply uh, in a straightforward way sort of assess um, claims that are made and put forward by different interest groups in the healthcare system. Um, to do the, the more, the deeper work to rigorously assess the, the impacts of interventions. Um, and to, to think more about leading, finding ways to lead in, in the larger conversation about important questions, important outcomes, um, et cetera, going forward. It's a little, as a qualitative researcher, this is a little bit self-serving for my field, but I know this is an audience that appreciates qualitative work as well as quantitative work. Ruth, you've more recently started adding qualitative work to your quantitative. In the spirit of talking about how your career has evolved, could you talk about what you think the addition of the qualitative has added to your thinking about your topics? Um, so so that's, that's true, that none of the projects that I'm working on now are actually purely quantitative, all has collaboration built in with qualitative colleagues. Um, and I think we sort of talk about, you know, the, there are these gaps in administrative data. Oh good, the qualitative will uh, we'll fix them, we'll be able to cover it off in the interviews, um, which is maybe my sort of initial <laughs> approach where I'm like, oh, we have these problems, qualitative will fix it. But I think what's been really valuable from it is very much the process of thinking through concepts in, in both ways, Think in being part of the conversations around designing the qualitative interview guide, um, the sort of iterative opportunities to then sort of go back to the plans for the administrative data. Um, so I think at a very basic level, 
I, there's so much exciting stuff we can do with the admin data, um, but the depth just isn't there. So no project would be complete without the qualitative piece. Um, but then it's very much my, been my experience, at least as limited as it is, that that process of the conversation and sort of the iterative nature of collaboration strengthens the quantitative piece as well and sort of shapes our thinking, um, at least so far. Uh, but again, your mileage may vary. That's like two years of expertise informing that, and uh, we'll see. Do you have related reflections? I think, I mean, it's been, um, you, you have more experience linking the two than I do. I think um, some combination of the qualitative and the, the, the really diverse team bringing in patients and clinicians and qualitative and quantitative researchers and decision makers um, I think it's also informative about, you know, here are the data we have today, and what are the data we'd like to have in the future going forward, right? You can't claim, you can't make the same claim necessarily about findings on the qualitative side and the quantitative side, but it tells us something about something that would be really important to measure on a larger scale in the, in the future. And so to the extent that we're not always going to rely on the pre-existing administrative data, and there's going to be room to fill in some data gaps <coughs> and those interactive discussions, I think, highlight, you know, because as a quantitative researcher, you get used to having what you have and you forget to think outside the box. Actually, I think that's exactly <laughs> it, is that it, it broadens the conversation really from the start. Uh, in your most recent project that you talked about, it, it's a big project. It's got three provinces, in each case you've got researchers, You've got professional associations, you've got government involved. I mean, that's it's not a simple project to pull together, especially for a junior researcher. I think researchers are being asked increasingly to try to do such work. Um, so can you just reflect on your experience in putting together a project like that? Is so, it so complicated? Yes, yeah, so there were an awful lot of moving pieces, an awful lot of letters of support, and an awful lot of conversations sort of well before the grant came together. Um, but it wasn't just me. Uh, I think it was really exciting to work with colleagues in two other provinces who are doing a lot of the same work on the ground um, to sort of build some of those relationships. But so, I mean, in planning it, it really did come come my initial presentation to doctors of DC around this being an idea, initial conversations with the ministry, were months and months and months before um, the grant deadline to really uh, allow some shaping of the direction and to make sure that we were getting things right. Um, I think it really helped that again, it was a topic that everyone was excited about or for their own reasons. So uh, that brought people around the table initially and I was really fortunate for that. Now it's the challenge of like actually getting the work done um, and coordinating all of those moving pieces and making sure that people are involved at the right time, have the right opportunities to contribute their very specific expertise, um, but that we're sort of getting the balance right. Um, and especially given that it's a, a really distributed team. So <laughs> we actually stole a lot of project governance material from Aaron's project around working group structures that could be, bring the right people who wanted to nerd out uh, on specific topics around the same virtual tables. It's all distributed, so we're using uh, sort of video software for all of it. Um, and my one tip there is just making people turn the cameras on changes conversations dramatically and that you're staring at faces from all over the pro or all across the country. So trying to get some of those like really the terms of reference right, the project structures right, so that um, you're taking advantage of the wealth of the team without having the whole team at every table all the time. It's been a learning process, um, but I think really critical so far. So ask me again uh, when the reporting is due, and I'll have a better answer. Um, but I think I've been really fortunate again that this was not something where I had to uh, cajole people to be involved for that, that, that there really are stakes in the uh, in the process and maybe then I can apply that to some of the questions that require a little bit more leadership and a little uh, more nudging on on my part so I don't know a lot of teleconferences but not with all the people at the same time 
and with videos on, even if you're in your, like, it's it, okay, like, you're in your house in your yoga pants, you're still allowed, like, we don't judge that. We have, we have knitters in the team who, like, knit during teleconferences and sort of check in on their progress, uh, but just actually having faces around a virtual table is really valuable. Anyway. Teleconferences, the answer is teleconferences, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any more yeah. um, I'm not sure if I gathered the information correctly, but on your in your study that you're currently doing now, mm -hmm. you're looking at, I guess, incentives of people that are choosing primary care as their, um, I guess, their residency or their specialty. Um, are you looking at just specifically Canadian med students, or are you looking from other provinces? Because from previous experience of working in healthcare, what I've come to know from word of mouth is that a lot of people who maybe have done their med school out of country, um, they're limited in terms of their the residencies that they can choose. So they're limited to primary medicine or residencies mm -hmm. like um, derm or gyne. Um, so I'm not sure if that's another factor that you're also considering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the international medical graduate pieces especially, so we have a lot of strict return for service agreements within the British Columbia context that shapes where international medical graduates practice and that sort of pushes them towards comprehensive care. So that's a big part of it. We're not looking around choice of specialty. We're sort of starting from the point that you're in a family medicine residency program. What next? Um, but on the qualitative side, we're very interested in, again, like structural factors and uh, payment-related issues that shape uh, practice choice, but also the host of personal, um, personal characteristics, practice interests, um, and how all of that intersects uh, to shape practice choices. So international medical graduates is key. We can't actually pull apart Canadians trained abroad from uh, folks who've migrated from abroad in the quantitative side, um, but, but a key theme, and, it, and it's one with the different meanings across the different provinces given policies around IMGs. Thank you. So uh, I have a question respect to uh, the last topic that was being discussed and how community is involved in research and how we mm -hmm. focus research on patients and what they really want. And thinking about also the primary healthcare strategy uh, vision of how patients should be involved in all the healthcare. Um, I want to ask you both, uh, how do you think we could work as researchers and as scholars in actually involving community in the whole process? Because we are always taking information from them, we're taking the data, we're taking all the interviews, and then we deliver this information in form of papers or research to policymakers. And it seems that it's like a very lineal process. So which will be our role as university and as researchers and each which steps of that process we could involve and engage community in a more valuable way. Mm -hmm. I'll take a start on that and then put to you for the, um, I'm going to show some smiling faces. So this is something I wrestled with. Um, lots of conversation around patient-oriented research, uh, but in the context of primary care, we're talking about everyone, like that everyone has a stake in primary care. Um, and so questions not so much around representativeness, but around having the right expertise in the room to speak to that diversity of patient experiences being really important, but also really challenging in the space of primary care. And a lot of the models I was looking to, you know, uh, not to pick up, so hip fractures um, or a hip, a hip replacement surgery. So everyone who has a hip replacement surgery has relevant expertise on that particular process of care. So you've at least whittled down the population a little bit, but still have to be attentive to a range of expertise. So I, I struggled a little bit with like what model made sense in the context of primary care, and especially with the fact that as someone really early in my career, I didn't have a lot of resources to have like a huge community consultation early in the process and that no individual researcher can really take that on. So what we've done in BC is um, through the Primary Healthcare Research Network put together a patient advisory. Um, it, so it's 10 patients uh, from around the province. So uh, folks who've experienced care in all of the different health authorities. We wanted to be attentive to a range of health needs um, within this group. Um, we wanted to be attentive to people who've recently migrated to BC, people whose first language is in English, um, indigenous, uh, British, uh, people, indigenous people in British Columbia. Um, and so, again, 
goal isn't representativeness, but the goal is a diversity of expertise. Um, and um, the group has been active in a couple ways to try to um, support primary care research. So um, they've been involved in grant review um, of projects where the idea was all already on the table and providing some feedback from, again, a broader patient perspective. But what we did over the past year was a priority setting process to try to get patient input from the very start of setting the research agenda, which was sort of beyond the scope of what any of us could take on as an individual researcher. Um, so I won't go into all of the methods, um, but I would love to talk more if it's of interest. So we, so we went through this process, and we now have ideas about patients. These are broad topics that should be pursued within research or that they were curious about what research evidence exists. Um, but it's been really useful in shaping research agendas and trying to be a little bit more attentive to those topics from the very start, rather than once we have the idea and we're looking for the patient partner on the team. Um, and then by the same point, the patient advisory consults on some projects where there's already a patient partner involved, but we're looking for, again, um, that breadth of expertise in the context of primary care. So these lovely people, um, so, it's been such a privilege and so much fun to work with this team over the past year. Um, and so that's the model that we're working in in BC. I'm not sure, we haven't got it quite right yet, but it's been really helpful in addressing that point of getting folks involved early um, and in trying to navigate this environment around primary care where uh, it, yeah, it has to work for everyone. Um, and that's a lot of people. Uh, but you have a really good model sort of in the project governance side on the context. Of yeah, no, I think this is really fascinating because I think it is a lot to ask every individual researcher or research team to figure out how to engage with patients and who the you know patients are that are willing and interested in doing that. And it's a lot. So in some sense, this kind of this model for some standing capacity of an, an advisory committee, right, at a provincial level, at a university level. I don't know what the right level is, but instead of it being incumbent on every researcher to find people. And this also helps shape the questions much earlier in the process than, than later. Um, I mean, at our first meeting of our, of our BC Quebec project on patient enrollment, we brought up the point that every single person in that room, we have you know, clinician researchers, qualitative, quantitative um, patient partners and decision makers from both provinces, and we just said, look, everybody in this room is an expert in our different ways, and everybody has something to contribute, and like, let's go, let's have, you know, and it's, that resonated a lot more than I ever could have imagined, and it comes back, you know, we've been in, I guess, about a year and a half in now, you know, different lots of teleconferences, in-person meetings, and, and somehow creating that partnership um, and recognizing that the expertise that everybody brings to the table, I think, was, was really important. Um, and I do think that, you know, again, we have this sort of new energy in Canada around patient-oriented research. My impression is that some provinces, some research centers are further ahead than others in thinking about that whole continuum. And so there's probably some, some lessons to be, to be learned across um, provinces and institutions because um, some of us are much further behind. I think for both of these, we're actually now at the stage where we're trying to be more reflective on the process. So Dr. Abelson, some of your work has been really helpful in structuring some of the, that thinking. Um, and so hopefully, now that we've sort of just gone and done it, we can reflect a little bit and, and maybe offer lessons that are, so again, ask me, ask me again in a year on that. I do think too, I mean, I feel like when I came out of my PhD program, it was still relatively new to be incorporating decision makers into research. And it was like, what? You want me to go talk to who over where and what ministry? You're like, you gotta be crazy. Like, I'm, I'm an academic. You know, I do um, a lot more professional texting <laughs> now um, in working with the patient group than I ever thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, but I'm hopeful that what seemed so bizarre 10, 15, 20 years ago and now is much more part of the course and institutionalized. Still relying on individual relationships, but that you know, it, that with time, the incorporating the patient perspective will won't seem so novel anymore. Any more questions? Well, let's thank again, Ruth and Anne.